you can start whenever you are uh, ready okay so uh, good afternoon everyone uh, this is the last technical session for our adult ftp and uh, the speaker for this session is dr himanshu sharma who is working as postdoctoral researcher at umia university sweden and the title of his talk for today is structural investigations of minimalistic cellular complexes in an evolutionary divergent so a brief info about uh, dr himanshu dr himanshu did his uh, phd at the indian institute of technology guwahati back in 2019 where his primary interests were ribosome biology and bacterial genetics he then joined umia university as a post doctoral researcher to study intracellular parasites using cryo electron microscopy he was awarded the mary skodoska curie actions fellowship by the european commission in 2021 to undertake this research he is involved in different areas of research and he had completed and published various research articles in national and international reputed journals and it is uh, we are very thankful to you for accepting our invitation and joining us today for the satel ftp i hope the uh, your talk will be very fruitful for us it seems to be a different topic for altogether for me as well uh, so thank you so much for joining and i request you to please start your talk uh, thank you roma uh, but for for that kind introduction and i have to agree with you that uh, yeah i am not uh, 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 means i am sort of an outsider to this field uh, because i am myself not a computational biologist uh, or into drug discovery but what i'll try to do today is i will try to introduce you to a couple of areas of research that we follow and i hope uh, towards the end of my talk you uh, the audience will see uh, a confluence of uh, areas which uh, are essentially driven by computation biology algorithm development uh, and which try to mend in the areas of infection biology um, and uh, possible in the future try to push towards something that would be uh, described as drug discovery so that is essentially not what we do uh, but uh, i hope you know you see a confluence developing here where uh, computation methods are driving the research towards uh, infection biology and discovery of or a characterization of new infection uh, based models so having said that uh, thank you for having me uh, and uh, i would uh, also like to thank deepak for the invitation but as i said i did feel that i was sort of out of place but i will try to fit in and uh, uh, describe my research i hope you can see the screen and uh, yes it's clear and hear my voice okay yes, uh, another thing is uh, in case uh, as this is a, a distinct topic to some of the viewers in case you have any doubt you are free to you know interrupt me anywhere between the talk so i wouldn't mind yeah so so yeah i'll try to explain you uh, some of the structural investigations that we are carrying out in uh, an evolutionary very distant organism Uh, but before i go uh, there i would uh, i'm speaking very far away from home and uh, it uh, as it is good afternoon for all of you i am just waking up and umia university as most of you might not have heard and uh, to be honest i has have a had also not heard about the university before actually accepting the post doctoral offer here so it's in the northern regions of sweden not very far from the arctic uh the winters are really long and very cold uh and dark uh but living near the arctic has its own charms as well where you know uh, when you are at the university you can also uh, when you are between those really no long uh nights uh, which can span over like 20 hours a day uh, you can still see uh, the beautiful northern lights which is a spectacle to watch in itself so going ahead uh, the, the department where i am employed is also uh, the essentially the department where the recent uh, nobel prize for 
the crispr cas9 studies were uh, was awarded to emmanuel charpentier and uh, her lab where he con where she conducted this uh, uh, nobel prize winning research was uh, was just you know two labs away so we used to sometimes walk down and you know look at the area where she used to do her research but yeah some trivia about umia university uh, a little about what i essentially do so as introduced uh, uh, i did my in uh, phd in guwahati and then moved to post postdoctoral research where i uh, primarily focus on two uh, modes of uh, research or two areas broad areas the first is infection mechanism of obligate intracellular pathogens and structural studies on rna protein complexes and pathogenic bacteria and uh, it is the first area that i'll be talking uh, more about today uh, essentially nothing about the second one so to give you a little primer about the obligate intercellular pathogens that i am uh, about to describe to you uh, let me introduce you to microsporidia uh, i'm not sure if uh, a lot of you know about microsporidia it's not a very well known uh, uh, phylum of organisms which are still classified as fungi but they are essentially an outgroup of fungi they have this have seemed to diverge uh, far away from the canonical fungi and the most uh, commonly used uh, model organism that is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So essentially, if you see these, uh, uh, these are the representative uh, microsporidian organisms, some of them which are also infectious to humans uh, and other systems which I will eventually talk about in during the course of my presentation. All of these organisms, the uh, unifying feature across this varied class of, uh, or the varied group of microsporidia is all of these organisms are essentially obligate in the cellular pathogens. Means that they cannot uh, survive outside the host. And, uh, to, and to give you a little more introduction about this. Uh, the microsporidia, uh, as they are obligate into the cellular pathogens, they only survive in, or they are only found as uh, uh, environmental spores outside the host cell. Uh, they go through uh, various uh, life stages, but essentially the one stage where they are found outside or in the environment are as these very uh, stable uh, spores, which have a lot of which have some of the uh, key uh, unique features. Some of them, you know, you can see the nucleus here, uh, a very thick uh, exospore uh, and an endospore, which is usually made up of chitin. Uh, they have this little disc at the top, which is called the anchoring disc. And the spore essentially uh, is sort of packed in a very high target pressure. And inside this pressure, uh, inside this spore, there is a uh, a unique organelle which is used for the infection mechanism. Uh, this is called the polar tube. So if you see this spring-like tube that is packed inside this spore, is essentially used to initiate the infection uh, and is sort of fired at the initiation of its uh, life cycle. The, uh, the life cycle of these org organisms can be you now broadly categorized into a couple of stages. For example, uh, I would be describing this for E. bionisi, but it is more or less conserved across the species or across the phylum for most microsporidia with minor variations, which I will not talk in detail about. Uh, so the first stage of the uh, infection is like a germination process where this uh, long tube is fired outside uh, at a very high speed where it sort of punctures into the host cell and injects all of the uh, spore cytoplasm or the sporoplasm inside the host cells. Once this delivery happens, the uh, various stages of uh, replication of the, the uh, microsporidia sporoplasm starts, and the cell goes to various stages of metagony, sporogony, and formation of mature spores. Uh, some of these stages, if you look at, are uh, also canonical to some of the other intercellular pathogens like uh, Plasmodium and Toxoplasma gondii. But essentially, uh, the cycle ends where the mature spores are formed and they are released, and then they you know they are ready to go in another cycle of infection. But the spores itself are very stable in their nature, and they can be they can sustain 
uh, environmental storage or being outside for really long times. Uh, to give you a little uh, idea about this process of germination, and I think in my view, this is one of the most uh, interesting procedures or the processes of the life cycle. Means most of these processes are interesting, but you know, this is something that you can visually recognize and uh, see. So here is this little spore that we had isolated. Uh, and then uh, we record the process in which this tube is germinated and throws out the uh, sporoplasm or the cytoplasm inside, uh, outside in the environment rather than having host cells. Just for the, uh, so as you would see, uh, I hope you're able to see this you know, little tube coming out and depositing this sporoplasm or the cytoplasm here. It's a very fast process. It's a very fast process and uh, Maybe it can be visualized in a more stepwise or frame-wise manner uh, uh, in this uh, cariogram. So here you would see, you know, the spore fires off this really long tube, which is several times its own length, and then uh, uh, and then you know delivers this uh, sporoplasm outside. And it's a really fast process, which takes in a couple of milliseconds. So. I think this is one of the coolest phenomena that uh, these organisms uh, display. Uh, and uh, to give you an idea about the variety of organisms or, you know, uh, so this is one of those organisms or one of those phylums of organisms which can really go across, infect uh, anything from locust, humans, birds, rodents, uh, honeybees, crab, uh, fish, and, uh, you know, even uh, worms. Uh, so, this, the organisms have been studied for quite a while now, but essentially uh, what is happening now is there are novel uh, model organisms or model hosts that are being developed to study the infection cycle. So, you know, one of the most prevalent uh, or the most being the forefront uh, stages of host being developed are essentially zebrafish, sea elegans and honeybees which you can also see you know in the broad category or broad categorization of organisms that they infect one of the other reasons uh, that they are of interest or studying microsporidia is of interest is because because they can infect this wide variety of organisms or host they uh, they bring out these challenges which are environmentally uh, uh, environmentally relevant they also, uh, you know, when they infect honeybees, they are also challenging the creating problems of food security probably in the future. And then, you know, obviously human health and animal health, because they can also infect almost all uh, organ uh, animals uh, pertinent to animal husbandry and, uh, you know, poultry, etc. Uh, one of the other reasons uh, is that, you know, these organisms are also used as biocontrol agents for you know, something that we would know uh, in India recently when we had the locust swamps. So one of the organisms is essentially used as a biocontrol agent from the last past five decades to control locusts. And maybe this is something, you know, useful when the next locust swamps hits our country. So as I said, because of their very divergent distribution, these organisms are divided into essentially four to five clades. And our uh, infection can, uh, and these organisms can be found in deep sea vents or deep sea nematodes uh, and range up to their infection, infectability to humans. So you can really see this wide gradation of uh, their uh, pathogenicity, which is also one of the other reasons that we are interested in uh, understanding and developing uh, more insights about how they infect uh, their uh, hosts and what is the cellular uh, machinery that they employ for uh, initiating this infection and sustaining their uh, you know, life cycle? So one of the other interesting reasons is, you know, they are really evolutionally very divergent. They are, th these organisms contain the smallest eukaryotic genome, uh, which uh, the lowest one is like 2.9 megabase pairs. And for a reference, uh, maybe some of you will be surprised that E. coli, which is a bacteria, which is a prokaryote, has a genome that is much larger than, you know, the smallest microsporidian uh, genome. 
they also have seen to lost of functional mitochondria and they possess the highest eukaryotic gene density so you know from this plot which was developed by uh, our lab uh, for a book chapter they have you know uh, plotted sort of the And essentially, you can see that these organisms uh, house the highest eukaryotic gene density across all organisms. So, hello. Yeah. Yes, you so, are audible. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes, you are audible. I got a notification in between. Yeah. So, essentially, because of all these unique evolutionary features. Uh, we got obviously interested into studying these organisms and one of the other features that we have been observing is that gene loss is also one of the most common features that uh, these organisms display where they you know they keep on losing uh, introns or intergenic uh, regions or even you know go on to minimize their own genes so for you know some of the organisms uh, for some of the microsporidia some of the genes or some of the pathways which you know somebody would my or consider absolutely essential for survival they also have seemed to lost those for example uh, most of us would think like glycolysis as one of the most essential pathways and it seems that some of the microsporidia have actually essentially lost uh, genes that are responsible for or the whole pathway that is essential for glycolysis or even for uh, the flagellum or you know other pathways that are pertinent to uh, tor or uh, rna interference or splicing which are essentially thought to be very important for eukaryotic organisms so i hope you see a theme emerging here where these organisms are sort of you no know, uh, on a spree where they lose components of their genome and go on to minimize it and this obviously raises uh, one question uh, like you know are these sort of these minimalistic systems of infection and uh, uh, and this is what got uh, us interested into studying these organisms where you know they seem to have this little uh, minimal apparatus where they infect the host and essentially the system is the, the for example the polar tube that i just displayed to you is also a unique infection mechanism uh, that they use to infect the host and once they have infected, they also use cellular pathways to recruit the uh, host organelles like the mitochondria, where they can steal the energy and then utilize it for their own uh, replication. Uh, obviously, one of the most uh, interesting things that we were wanted to look at is this uh, highly reduced cellular machinery, uh, which comes an outcome comes as an outcome of the genetic. Uh, reduction or the reductionist approach that you saw in their genomes and uh, the one of the last things is that no one single microsporidia can also infect multiple organs uh, and this also or multiple tissues and this is also one of the uh, things that uh, we would like to investigate in the long term that how these organisms with like this minimal genome and a very limited infection apparatus can go and infect multiple tissues at a time rather than you know being like tissue specific which is also a case for uh, a lot of uh, bacteria uh, and uh, other uh, infectious organisms uh, but today uh, i will be focusing more on you know the first parts of the study uh, and uh, pertain more of you know uh, on these three points that i just talked about so we have uh, primarily two directions of research that is uh, towards these organisms that is to investigate the minimal cellular machinery that they use to support their own uh, uh, growth which is primarily addressed using structural studies of molecular complexes and uh, evolution of minimized uh, cellular machinery uh, and the other uh, uh, part that we focus on is the how these organisms initiate an infection or invade the host cell so uh, here we are looking into the investigation uh, into studying the infection apparatus or the polar tube. So, but 
because these organisms are sort of this specialized uh, or obligate intracellular pathogens, there are very uh, significant challenges, and some of them, you know, can be categorized as because these are obligate intracellular parasites. The, the culturing is very challenging. We can only culture a handful of these, uh, and it's really difficult to work with anything that infects humans. Uh, after that, you know, most of these proteins that these organisms have also seem to be new and very evolutionary divergent and are sort of very difficult to identify if at the first stage and then express and purification also complicates as we go down. And the last problem is that, you know, we also find, we are also in a dearth of any transcriptomic or, prote or proteomic data regarding these organisms. But, you know, these things are also opportunity in some way, but, and we like to use, um, look at these, you know, problems as more like opportunities to address the problems that we face here. So first I'll be talking about uh, the characterization that we had taken up for one of those minimal cellular machineries. And uh, what better uh, model for molecular machines than be the ribosome. So as most of you would know, ribosomes are essentially uh, large organelles inside organisms or large molecular machines, which are involved in synthesizing proteins. They, uh, so, no, the prokaryotic ribosomes can be essentially characterized or essentially described as in two parts where they are made up of the 23s rRNA and the 5s RNA with a couple of ribosomal proteins. And the smaller subunit is also made up of a 16s rRNA, about 21. And these, com these two subunits combine to form the uh, 70s uh, ribosome. Uh, for the eukaryotes, they have some additional components where uh, they have the single 28s rRNA, a little larger than the bacterial counterpart. They also have an additional 5.8s rRNA, uh, the 5s rRNA, and a much larger number of uh, ribosome proteins for the smaller subunit, as well as the larger subunit, uh, larger than the smaller subunit. And essentially, they have the 60s and 40s component that forms the 80s ribosome. One of the reasons that we chose to study this, uh, uh, take this, uh, take the ribosomes as one of the uh, the first uh, uh, models that we would uh, undertake to characterize uh, evolution of uh, cellular machines, is because the ribosome seems to be one uh, like one of these constants in uh, you know changing paradigm of. Uh, molecular pathways because you know ribosomes are required to make all the other cellular proteins and you and if you look across the common theme of ribosome evolution you would see that you know from bacteria to lower eukaryotes to higher eukaryotes that is humans common core uh, has always been preserved you know, which essentially you know contains uh, is made up is uh, very close to what the bacteria have but essentially much uh, smaller, the common core is much smaller than what it is seen for Saccharomyces cerevisiae or uh, normal fungi. And uh, as we look across the evolutionary spectrum, what we see is that you know, the ribosomes have actually expanded over the, uh, the course of evolution. And as organismal uh, complexity has increased, the size of the ribosome has also increased. So the so this is a general theme of the evolution of bacteria or you know of ribosomes where you know the ribosomes in bacteria seem much smaller than archaea and archaea are thought as you know this divergent point where you know uh, even larger eukaryotic ribosomes are being observed and if you look at this little chart here you would see that you know uh, the ribosomes that are found in humans or other higher organisms are essentially much way larger than that are seen in bacteria uh, but what we see is that you know this evolution is driven by uh, addition of you know specific ribosomal proteins as you would have seen in the numbers that it was swelling up as we go from human uh, from bacteria to use to humans and then finally there is also an expansion in the length of the ribosomal rna so you know as we go across from here to here, we see that you know there is an expansion in the uh, length of the ribosomal RNA, and essentially these ex this expansion can be portrayed as something that is called an expansion segment in the ribosomal RNA. 
So I will try to explain this using one example that is the helix 25, uh, you know, in the ribosome, uh, if you were to represent the structure of the ribosomal RNA, uh, one of the helices or the stems of the RNA, uh, this is how it develops. So this is the helix 25 that how it looks like in the bacteria E. coli. And as this, uh, and we, as we sort of start increasing the organismal complexity, you would see that this common core of helix 25 is still conserved up till humans. You know, this little core here, the common core that started with bacteria. But what you would see is, you know, this ancillary regions that are being, you know, added on or accre accreted to each of these stages. So essentially, when you start from bacteria and go up to Homo sapiens, you see this, you know, common core being conserved and a lot of other additional sequences or, you know, RNA fragments being added to the, uh, to, uh, to, the to, to the ribosomal RNA. And this is just one example. And this happens across the spectrum of the ribosome where, you know, the helix uh, for helix number for uh, the smaller subunit itself can go up to like 44, 45. So, you know, you can imagine that there are uh, a number of regions or expansion segments which are added. But what essentially happens is uh, that, you know, as organismal complexity increases, you see this, you know, uh, increase in uh, evolution of the ribosome where uh, it reaches a common core and then evolves or diversifies by adding proteins and ribosomal RNA uh, in terms of length and numbers to develop into organism specific uh, functions. So as I described before, humans or you know, yeast uh, in the previous slides. So, so this little model where you know, the uh, sequences are added onto the ribosome to increase its length and diversify its function, it's called the accretion model of ribosome evolution. So you know, it's just accretion of fragments and uh, proteins to form this uh, larger or diversified complex. Uh, but now here I come for the little twist uh, where Microsporidia, uh, which uh, I hope I have established that, you know, they are uh, sort of going on reducing the size of their organelles. And one of the studies by our lab uh, back in 2019 established that uh, when it solved this structure of the ribosome from Virimorphan nicatrix, one of the uh, uh, Microsporidia species that infect moth, uh, what they observed was, you know, the ribosomes from Microsporidia sort of seem to defy the accretion model. So they, you know, they sort of put this, uh, defy this little trend of uh, aggregating functions and sequences of the ribosome for its, uh, for deriving new functions. So as you would see, uh, the ribosome, uh, ribosomal RNA from E. coli is around 1500 in length, whereas the, in microsporidia was much smaller than that. And this is essentially, you know, one of the most interesting parts where this, you have this eukaryote here, which you know you would think that um, would essentially uh, has brought down its uh, composition of the ribosomal RNA, which is much lesser than even the small when than even the laboratory bacteria that we use, and has also sort of fused the 23s rRNA, uh, the two components like the 5.8s into and 25s into a single uh, RNA. So so in in essence, they are also somehow, you know, mimicking these bacteria uh, or even going or even chopping down their uh, machinery to minimal sizes, even than bacteria. And at this point, it was sort of uh, becoming more and more, uh, becoming, we were becoming curious about, you know, how these uh, fun ribosomes are actually functioning in this highly reduced state. Uh, and the loss of the experience and essentially what we observed also was that you know this decrease in the size is actually coming from the loss of expansion segments which was sort of prevalent across uh, the ribosomal rna here uh, if you look at the uh, structure of the secondary structure of the small the ribosomal rna corresponding to the smaller subunit you would see that the the regions that are shown in dots are essentially deleted or are missing from the uh, ribosome that is uh, pertaining to Weimar-Fund nicotrix. And at this stage, uh, uh, we also, the lab also observed that 
apart from losing out a lot of this information, these organisms have also developed some uh, ribosomal proteins which are uh, unique to microsporidia. And apart from uh, inventing new uh, ribosomal proteins, they have also uh, sort of uh, designed two uh, ribosome binding factors uh, that are shown in MDF1 and MDF2, which bind to the active site of the ribosome and sort of uh, sequester it from the uh, uh, from active translation. And this process is essentially called uh, uh, ribosome hibernation. And uh, what we actually see is that you know apart from uh, uh, the novel ribosomal proteins, they also have novel uh, uh, or uh, new mechanisms of ribosome hibernation, which are somewhat different from the current understood models. I would not probably try to uh, give you a lot of detail about how this uh, evolution is happening, but essentially the questions that we posed uh, after looking at the structure was, you know, how diverse are the microsporidian ribosomes? Is this a general theme that you know they have cut down their sequences or their information or the component that they have and how uh, how essentially how diverse they are and do they have other novel mechanisms of ribosome hibernation because both of these uh, 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 and i think because of the uh, essentially uh, environmental nature of the spores uh, we think that right uh, uh, microsporidia would essentially be very good organisms which uh, could be used as a model for understanding ribosome hibernation where you know ribosomes are put aside for uh, conditions where the media or the growth conditions are much better and then they can employ back these ribosomes to uh, uh, to you know make new proteins rather than degrading the ribosomes which is very cost very costly for the cells and then making them again at every end of you know uh, or any every cycle of uh, growth rich mediums being present so to study uh, so from here we went on to uh, you know uh, characterize one of the other uh, microsporidia ribosomes and the, one of the obvious candidates that we wanted to look at was you know the organism that is used as a biocontrol agent against uh, locust and uh, the other interesting reason was you know the first structure that was solved was for this uh, birimorphan nicotrix and the second or the uh, the uh, the organism that we want to look at is the sema lacustae so you know uh, because of their very evolutionary divergence you always see uh, the naming convention or the classification of microsporidia you know changing over period of time so this is not very far away when you know these organisms were called Nosema lacustae, and now they have been renamed probably a couple of years back, maybe four or five years back, to Paranosema lacustae. So they, you know, Microsporidia do seem undergoing this change in their classification and designation of the phylum. But yeah, uh, but because this uh, Paranosema lacustae uh, could also be uh, are also an interesting biocontrol agent, and that was one of the reasons that we uh, tried. We undertook a study to understand the ribosomes in this organism. So the methodology is very simple, uh, but long. We essentially use the host as locuste migratoria, uh, which are infected with the spores from Paranosema locuste and then incubated for the infection to develop in these organisms. Uh, once the incubation period is over, we collect the surviving host and uh, dissect to take out the adipose tissue. Uh, we isolate the spores and lyse them to take them to ultracentrifugation where we spin down the ribosomes and then we suspend the ribosomes in a resuspension buffer. And then we try to look them uh, using cryo-electron microscopy. So, uh, the so essentially this is the part that I will try to go in more detail about today uh, and show you one of some of the findings that we have from uh, our studies on cryo-electron microscopy. So essentially cryo-electron microscopy, as you all might know, is transmission electron microscopy as cryo-temperatures. So essentially, you know, we have a vitrified sample, which uh, 
uh, is sort of maintained in a hydro, uh, hydro, uh, no, uh, in a, in its physiological state where it is still hydrated uh, and not forced into a single conformation uh, like, uh, for example, uh, X-ray crystallography. And uh, using this technique, it is also possible to visualize variability in the 3D structure of or the 3D states of the complex. And uh, one of the Hello? Yes, yes, now it's coming. Okay, yeah, I got a notification. Okay. Is it it's audible now, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, it's okay now. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and one of the interesting things is, you know, this technique can be used to uh, visualize across a wide spectrum of uh, size or shapes of organisms, where you know it can directly go from cells to you know really small molecules, and uh, it makes it a, makes it a very versatile uh, technique. Essentially, the, uh, there are two modes in which cryo-electron microscopy is done. That is a single particle analysis where we visualize samples under the electron microscope in a fixed angle. And one of the other techniques is uh, called tomography, where the sample is visualized by tilting in the electron microscope. Uh, and what I'll be talking to you uh, first is about the single particle analysis. So the workflow is uh, comes on, you know, from uh, being able to isolate those ribosomes and putting them onto this uh, little grid, which is about three millimeters wide, and putting into uh, an electron microscope, followed by collecting uh, transmission electron images, which are essentially in terms of these pictures, which are called micrographs, which are, you know, uh, picked, classified, and uh, used to derive a 3D model. And uh, essentially, you know, the uh, the sample preparation is much smaller, much easier uh, as compared to something like electron uh, X-ray crystallography, where you know here we just need to take our liquid sample in its uh, normal you know liquid form without usually without any additives, put it to an electron microscopic grid, and instantly uh, freeze it or plunge freeze it into liquid ethane which is at minus 6, 160 degrees celsius uh, after this uh, the grids are always stored in liquid nitrogen temperatures that is minus 196 degrees celsius and then viewed uh, uh, into uh, viewed to generate images like this and i'm not sure if you are able to you know, see these little molecules here uh, which are essentially, you know, uh, the molecular complexes, which are, uh, which are usually, you know, uh, pictured and then processed to generate more images. And when we talk about uh, the data acquisition, data acquisition, this is how generally an cryo-electron microscope looks like. Uh, and the, you know, the data collection process initially uh, starts with bombarding very high energy electrons, which can go up to 300 electron uh, kilo kilovolts followed by the scattering of these electrons when they uh, you know touch the sample and then they scatter and the scattering is essentially you know one of the reasons that the image is formed and but this generates a really huge amount of data and uh, but the images that are generated are essentially projections of 3d objects so these are essentially 2d projections of 3d objects and this is why uh, the 2d projections have to be uh, sort of averaged and used to reconstruct a 3D volume. Uh, so, for example, if you are looking at this hand or this projection of the hand here, it has to be imaged from various directions such that it can be reconstructed to uh, have this, you know, finally look at this rabbit again rather than, you know, uh, assuming that it's a hand that we are looking at. 
So this is the area where biology enters the domain of image processing. So uh, this is a very nice example where you can, you know, uh, sort of uh, look at this example image where, you know, you can have all of these uh, molecules which can be oriented in random directions. And if you were to take a picture uh, and average, uh, we would think, you know, we can derive out uh, one single cow or one single particle out of it. But the cryo -EM images are essentially have a very low signal to noise ratio. And this is where image processing comes in. And this is where, you know, we have to sort of engage ourselves into uh, aligning and, you know, uh, averaging, the, uh, averaging the images to solve the signal to noise ratio problem. So the process would essentially have, you know, start with uh, the raw images, something similar to what I showed you just now, which are, you know, extracted one at a time and then aligned in and classified into various images, into groups of images. So for example, if we have an initial model that can be used to classify these projections, or it can also be, uh, this can also be created using the, uh, uh, the 2D images. So this is sort of a two and four process uh, and depends on what kind of molecule we are handling. But essentially when we would take these images and average them out, we would essentially be creating 2D class averages of the images that we have. Uh, the two dimensional class averages or three dimensions from a three dimensional model. And then essentially try to reconstruct a three dimensional model from these two dimensional images. And essentially this is one of the computation bottlenecks of the whole process. And um, I'm happy to say that, you know, essentially this process, this is one of the forefronts of development of uh, methodology of cryo-electron microscopy, where a lot of people have been working at various stages where, you know, uh, extraction of raw images or classification or uh, averaging and generating a 3D models has been their primary uh, driver to improve these uh, methodologies or these algorithms to take out these images and generate 3D models from them. So essentially uh, coming back to our methodology where we were trying to analyze the sample using a cryo-electron microscopy, uh, we just went on to collect about 5,200 images uh, or the single micrographs. And from these, we extracted around 300,000 two-dimensional images of the ribosome. These images were used to de derive uh, a 3D map of the density or the electron density of the RNA and the protein. And this map is essentially used to build one chain or you know, one molecule of or one protein and one RNA molecule at a time to derive the final model of how the ribosome looks like in microsporidia. So uh, because these are microsporidia and we had very little information about uh, how uh, the proteins or the RNA looks like, we had to actually go back into uh, the genomes of these organisms, which were you know, partially annotated or even partially assembled. And then we had to you know, sort of manually and computationally sit down and look at each of these components, uh, identify 50 or 60 proteins and some RNAs to you know, get the sequence. Uh, and the sequences could be built back into this model. This is not something that happens in all the cases, but this is a special case scenario because we were dealing with microsporidia. We had to you know, go back and look at this computationally. So essentially when we uh, solved the structure of the cytoplasmic uh, ribosome for micros uh, microsporidia, we essentially derived a structure that was at a resolution of 2.7 angstroms. And here you can look at the structure where the uh, the 40s is represented in this yellow and green color and the 60s is represented on this side uh, and still using the convention of the eukaryotic uh, ribosomes because these are eukaryotes and we need not you know change them to even if they are smaller they are to uh, 30s or 50s like bacteria so one of the other features that uh, we looked at these when we looked at these ribosomes that were that the 40s, uh, the particle or the smaller subunit is uh, oriented, uh, has this little region which is called the head 
region of the smaller subunit was in two different orientations uh, based on the two classes of the particle that we essentially looked at. So if you were to look at this uh, small region that is called the head region here, it is sort of in a slightly rotated form. And I think this is one of the beautiful features of uh, cry electron microscopy that you can still uh, you know, look at uh, samples which are heterogeneous in nature uh, and derive to you know, different uh, sort of classes. Uh, for ribosomes, this can, this can still be done with the X-ray crystallography, but I think this becomes, or this heterogeneity becomes a much larger problem when you deal with uh, proteins which are much smaller in size or heterogeneity uh, or, uh, or size or conformation than the ribosome. Nevertheless, uh, this is something that we observed that uh, uh, out of majority for particles, a lot of them were in this uh, one state, which is usually called the non rotated or the rotated the second is a rotated state of the head of the smaller subunit uh, and what we also uh, looked at uh, found was that you know these ribosomes were essentially bound with a single factor in their active site if you remember uh, 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 the other ribosome that i talked about from vidimov and Nicotrix, they also had this uh, uh, microsporidia specific uh, hibernation factors uh, which were bound in the active site and it was also surprising that in this uh, structure also we found uh, one of the factors that was bound to the active site of the ribosomes but uh, was totally different from the two factors which are essentially looked at in the other uh, species that is pyrimorphon nicotrix and additionally uh, we also found you know, some density corresponding to uh, a transfer RNA or a tRNA in the exit site of the smaller subunit, which can be also seen bound to the larger subunit. But we did not build this because the density was much too weak and it was only seen in maybe 40% of the class, which was in the rotated state. Uh, apart from this little factor that was bound in the active site, we also found uh, like a structural nucleotide which was inserted between two proteins uh, in this little pocket here uh, on the ribosome and can be sort of visualized in this region where you know you see this little uh, AMP nucleotide inserted between the ribosome protein L20 and L6. I will talk about this a little further but these were the, 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 the most two prominent observations that we made just directly at, by looking at the structure. So we assumed that this is uh, uh, one of the factors that is LSO2 uh, and uh, this is an interesting story that how we actually found that this is an LSO2 uh, because uh, there are a couple of other hibernation factors. So the hyper ribosome hibernation is something that is preserved from bacteria to higher eukaryotes and they essentially employ a lot of uh, uh, mechanisms which essentially work at the stage of dimerized ribosomes, that is uh, at a 100 stage. So usually, as I'm talking about 80s or 70s ribosomes, when ribosomes dimerize, they form a complex that uh, travels as a 100s uh, particle. And most of these, uh, a lot of these uh, hibernation factors either work with 100s or 110s ribosomes, and only a couple of them actually work at the 70s or the 80s stage. Uh, and when we look at this uh, little factor that is bound in our structure is also bound in the active sites of the both the subunits that is the smaller subunit where the peptidyl transferase center is located and uh, here it is located at the uh, acceptor tRNA site and the peptidyl tRNA site of the larger subunit. Uh, and if we were trying to overlap it with uh, the incoming uh, accepted tRNA or the peptidyl transferase tRNA, you would see that you know one end or the end terminus of this uh, factor LSO2 uh, blocks the peptidyl transferase center on the smaller subunit, while the other ends or this hinge and the C-terminal end block the the peptidyl tRNA and the C-terminal uh, uh, peptidyl and the, I know uh, the accepted tRNA on the larger subunit. Uh, how we got to know about uh, this is LSO2 was 
you know a couple of i think in 2018 another study was published in yeast which talked about the association of lso2 uh, uh, and its ability to bind to uh, yeast ribosomes but when we were actually processing the data for uh, the the ribosome data set that we have here uh, at the same time essentially the group which had conducted this research also published uh, the structure of lso2 bound to human and eukaryotic ribosomes so you know we are in middle of collecting our data and then you know we see the study coming out but essentially it was a preprint so we were happy that you know we didn't get directly scooped by it but yeah i think this was uh, also a reinforcement for us that these factors are still bound but uh, but when we looked deeply into the study what we observed was that uh, there was a difference in uh, the way these hibernation factors were utilized in yeast uh, humans and uh, uh, microsporidia uh, so this can be this is something that can be looked at the efficiency of with which this uh, factors is used for ribosome hibernation for example the the study that i just described here was using two modes of uh, uh, binding uh, two modes of study where they sort of try to reconstitute or throw in purified uh, hibernation factor with the ribosome uh, that is the first study that is on the left and uh, they also tried to isolate ribosomes from the cells which were inherently bound to these factors or to the factor LSO2 and what you would see is that in in the in vitro reconstitution only 50% of their particles were actually bound to the factor LSO2 and this was even worse when they looked at the factors which uh, you know the the amount of population of ribosomes which was bound to the factor in uh, in 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 vitro or the native complexes that is only 15% and 6% respectively of two different data sets were uh, bound to these uh, uh, ribosomes if you remember uh, you know it also would be uh, a fraction of particles that what we collected we collected around 300000 particles uh, whereas this study collected almost 600000 particles to make this one data set uh, and in our case uh, almost 92% of the ribosomes were bound to LSO2. So I think uh, at this stage, we were pretty confident that uh, between yeast or humans and microsporidia, there is some sort of difference in the efficiency with which LSO2 is utilized or is able to uh, is able to block hibernation and maybe it is again the reductive nature of microsporidia where they you know they try to utilize uh, a minimal cellular machinery to block ribosomes rather than uh, having a spectrum of other hibernation factors which are found uh, in uh, in yeast or humans uh, one of the other uh, observations that we also made was the compaction uh, of RNA is very prevalent in microsporidia and I think this was uh, I also talked about this uh, where uh, I was setting the background for this presentation where the viriform and the catrix ribosomes were solved uh... hello yes you are audible yeah. yes audible yeah thank you so the virimorph and nicatrix ribosomes were uh, much smaller than the Saccharomyces cerevisiae and had lost a lot of these you know expansion segments that i just talked about which are seen in yellow orange or blue here and these are essentially lost totally in virimorph and nicatrix but what we observed in case of p lacustre was or paranesima lacustre was these uh, fragments are just in Know, transition of being lost so you would see these expansion segments which are highly reduced or lost in some ways for example the h6 here is sort of only partially present but e6 uh, e6 a e6 c e6 b are totally lost and and even the fragments of which uh, you know h9 or h6 are even lost here in virimorph and nicatrix and this uh, is prevalent uh, 
flew out the ribosome if we were to turn it and look at the other expansion segment you would see you know this pattern emerging where three lacoste seems like an intermediate stage of evolution of this ribosome where only a fragment of the ribosomal uh, rna or the expansion segments are lost uh, and but but this does delineate this themes or we see an intermediate stage and establish that you know rna compaction is very prevalent in uh, microsporidia where they do this by losing expansion segments or regions of the ribosomal rna one uh, uh, you know one expansion segment at a time and i think one of the most interesting features was uh, or this uh, extreme cases of rna compaction was this little region which i just talked about uh, the presence of uh, the nucleotide so essentially if you were to look at the yeast ribosome and you were looking at the ribosomal protein l20 and l6 you would see this you know expansion segment 36 which is sort of inserted between these two proteins and sort of stabilizes them but what we see in the ribosome for p lacoste is that this uh, expansion segment is significantly reduced to only a partial region that is uh, shown in dark blue here but but what we hypothesize is happening here is that you know this one nucleotide is actually replacing this whole large chain of the rna and stabilizing these two proteins uh, uh, by by you know inserting an amp molecule like a clamp and uh, sort of stabilizing this uh, uh, protein protein interaction on the ribosome which essentially is one of the functions of the expansion segments or the rna but uh, nevertheless this was a, a very interesting example where you know extreme rna compaction where uh, a whole fragment or a long fragment of the rna could be replaced by a single nucleotide just by inserting a single base uh, an amp between uh, two ribosomal proteins to stabilize their interaction so the stump the structural summary that we derived from uh, this work was that the p lacoste ribosome represents this intermediate stage of microsporidian reductive evolution uh, and lso2 is a novel hibernation factor uh, and rna compaction is extremely prevalent in microsporidia uh, and can be seen to various degrees that i just described but there are a lot of other open questions uh, prevalent to um, our work here which is how ribosome function and biogenesis is managed in this uh, reduced eukaryotic ribosome uh, further what is the exact stage of lso2 binding and what stage of microsporidia infection triggers ribosome hibernation so you know there are a lot of open questions but uh, there is only a handful of what we can address using these uh, obligate intercellular pathogens uh, and the work is still underway but uh, having to do with the uh, the stages of infection or uh, how the infection uh, progresses is one of the other areas which we are interested in as a lab and here uh, i will sort of shift gears and try to take you uh, on one of the other research projects that we are working on and if you remember my initial slide about the direction of research it is about uh, the invasion of the uh, one of the other research direction was how this uh, invasion happens how the infection is uh, established and it progresses and to study that we essentially would like to understand how the infection is initially established uh, using this uh, in specialized infection apparatus that i just talked to you about that is the polar tube so the polar tubes have been studied for a while now uh, probably from the early 1970s uh, so for example i think the earliest report of uh, microscopic investigation of uh, polar tubes dates back somewhere in the 1870s uh, where you know this little organelle was described coming out of the spores and then going on to uh, maybe infect the host species so a lot of electron microscopy that is uh, conventional uh, translate, transmission electron microscopy has been done and some studies have reported the more or less the you know, 
stained or low resolution ultra low resolution structures of the polar tube uh, where it seems to come out from this little anchoring disc that is located on the tip of the spores and then throw out uh, this tube uh, which goes on to you know uh, infect the host cell but the problem uh, with uh, most of these techniques is that you know the conventional tra transmission electron microscopy uh, uh, is that you know it's it, most of these structures are ultra low resolution and don't actually give you any descriptive information about the mechanism by which the tube works so one of the first uh, things that we want to do to understand these was that you know we wanted to understand what this tube is made up of and uh, how the structure itself organizes uh, to form this uh, infection apparatus so here we go back to our original model organism that is V. necatrix, that is the parasite of the moths. And then uh, the components of the tube uh, are essentially being studied for some time now. And it is thought that they are made up of uh, something called polar tube proteins, which are being still characterized and we know of six polar tube proteins right now. So the initial strategy that we had was, you know, we would try to go and purify all of these polar tube proteins, biochemically characterize them, you know, uh, do some binding and reconstitution of the polar tube and then, you know, structurally characterize this complexes. Uh, so long story short, I tried for almost six months and uh, failed to produce any of these proteins for almost low or almost no yields where they could be crystallized or used for any other further studies. So we had to change our strategy. Uh, and go back to you know, looking at tubes under the transmission electron microscope. So conventionally, when uh, the tubes are looked at the electron microscope uh, uh, in the normal mode, they are done by staining the tube before or staining the sample before they are actually put into the transmission electron microscope. And this essentially introduces artifacts which can be interpreted almost to anything. And this is something we wanted to avoid. And hence, uh, we try to look at these tubes directly in cryo-electron microscopy. But the, the sad part is that the tubes are much too thick for single particle analysis individually. So we had to look out for one of the other method methodologies that I just uh, introduced in the initial parts of my slides, that is electron cryo-electron tomography. So apart from uh, in distinction from single particle analysis, uh, cryo-electron tomography is essentially where the sample, uh, the vitrified sample or the frozen sample is rotated at different angles in the electron microscope. And then you know, one would collect all these projections, the 2D projections from each of these angles, and then draw uh, a tilt series. Uh, each of these tilt series is essentially used to uh, uh, reconstruct uh, the final 3D tomogram or the you know, back projections are, uh, are averaged again to, to create a 3D volume uh, and the 3D volume that is called a tomogram, a three-dimensional tomogram and the tomogram can be divided into smaller parts that is you know, sub-tomograms and uh, one could look at different regions of a tube or different regions of a sample to derive you know uh, maybe various cellular features uh, and character and categorize them essentially as subtomograms. So this is something we got interested into uh, and were uh, got into looking at it. And this is some very uh, preliminary data that I'm showing you and it has not been published. Uh, but essentially what we did was we took these spores uh, uh, that were stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius. We washed them and tried to germinate them and then plunge freeze them directly on the uh, on the grids which are frozen on liquid ethane instantly. So what we expect is, you know, as these polar tubes are coming out of these pores, they are still, you know, uh, sort of trapped on these grids, and we will be able to look at them in the electron microscope. So we went on to collect a tilt series by rotating the sample in the electron microscope and generate uh, a tilt series to uh, essentially look at the tomogram. So again, as I said, this is really a very preliminary data that I'm showing you, but what 
you would see here is sort of very similar to you know people in biology or conventional biology if they have looked at 3d sections or, or, or sections of uh, 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 an organelle or dissected or created sections this is essentially that uh, you were looking at the sections of a tube as you go from one layer to another so this is a polar tube and i hope you can you know uh, see this you know tube coming and going out and look at these various layers of the tube uh, and essentially you know uh, if i were to zoom in a little you would again see you know uh, various features where the tube is uh, again visible and i don't know if uh, you can see you know this little uh, uh, organelle here that is the proteasome so you know essentially when you look at these uh, 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 images under the high uh, magnification that we are looking at right now you would see this you know individual organelles just lying outside the uh, tomograms but uh, but there is also heterogeneity in terms of the samples that we are looking at for example this is another tube that we also looked at and you could also see individual ribosomes uh, and proteasomes inside the cell so what we are essentially seeing is the 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 you know the spores are actually pushing out the uh, uh, cytoplasm and throwing it outside and this is the phenomena that we were essentially able to capture within this you know this millisecond scale phenomena that we were able to capture here so uh, essentially there are some highlights that i would like to show you here that is you know these large fibril structures that we look at you know the multi layered structure of the tube some regular features that are looked outside and you know essentially these vesicles which are also inside the tube probably these are the cytoplasm and then other macromolecular complexes which we could see essentially straightforward so having said that you know there is obviously variation in the tube as we looked across the sample which i will not go a lot into detail about but i hope you you know see a pattern emerging here where we look at the tube but because this is very you know preliminary data uh, we have some future directions where we look like to you know characterize the structure of the polar tube more and look at the individual proteins and maybe in the future try to you know design inhibitors uh, of the polar tube or the protein individually where they can uh, inhibit host cell invasion uh, here i would like to take a break again and then you know uh, change gears and then you know come back to computation the role of computational biology uh, in cryo electron microscopy because cryo electron microscopy is essentially you know changing the way we do biology and address some of these very key questions for example if you look at the growth of structures you know from in the past 10 or 20 years the number of structures that are being uh, deposited to mpr or pdb has been increasing significantly and maybe in the next couple of years you know you would see where the number of x-ray structures starts to go down and it, you know the number of cryogenic structures sort of increases uh, and if you look at the spectrum of how the resolution limit or resolution uh, revolution is happening in cryo electron microscopy you would essentially see a lot of these you know uh, is it, interesting targets like the anthrax spore or the 20s proteasome or the 70s ribosome being regularly addressed and identified at a very high resolutions to you know which makes it uh, an interesting technique to look at with much ease and design uh, inhibitors and drugs against uh, and you know it comes a time you know, one of the most interesting uh, studies that recently came out was this uh, study where you know the group could look at ribosomes bound to an antibiotic inside cells so they didn't have to actually purify the ribosomes they could directly take the bacteria uh, and visualize visualize these ribosomes inside the cells and also could visualize the antibiotic that was complexed with this ribosome inside the cells at 3.5 angstrom resolution so maybe this can give you an idea about how powerful the technique is that you know you don't have to actually purify your sample and you could look at your ribosomes in this heterogeneous soup of cells uh, inside without actually purifying anything uh, and you know uh, 
the obvious uh, COVID mention, where the most recent uh, SARS-CoV-2 structure was also solved by cryo electron microscopy. So maybe you know uh, you can uh, appreciate that you know cryium is pushing the forefront of uh, drug discovery. But having said that, it is you know cryium is essentially you know at you know it's a it's a multipartite problem. But one of the hearts of this problem is the computational uh, resource or you know the computational uh, uh, effort that goes into solving a cryium structure. Uh, where you know, uh, for example, the uh, for any of these images, uh, the algorithm has to you know look into and account for like five degree of degrees of freedom when it is actually you know trying to average back these particles, and this is essentially a computational problem. Uh, I am not you know I would say qualified enough to give you a lot more detail about you know all of these algorithms. But what I would say is essentially, you know, there are a lot of computational problems, which are, uh, uh, you know, for example, one of the other problems, apart from, you know, handling this huge computation of five degrees of freedom is, you know, the growing uh, pace at which, you know, the databases are growing. For example, you know, this is the uh, growth, the cumulative data growth in terms of terabytes for the entire database. And, you know, essentially this is two things represent, uh, in a sense, some of the other problems that uh, computational biology is addressing and algorithm design is addressing by designing more efficient and faster microscopes uh, and also designing more methods to uh, acquire data in a more automated and faster manner on the microscopes. And Yeah. And you know, streamline uh, even more advanced algorithms for image processing, and you know, develop new techniques of data storage and compression. You know, of this ever-growing amount of data that comes from cryo microscopy, and you know, obviously the molecular representation. So essentially, I would end here by you know, acknowledging the lab uh, and some of the funding agencies and some of our collaborators, and um, I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Himanshu. Uh, participants, you can please ask questions. You can put your question in the chat box. Or if you want, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask questions. Yes, please. I had changed the settings. You can uh, ask your question. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Shimanshu, Himanshu. Such a wonderful and uh, Himanshu, sorry, um, for such a wonderful, uh, nice presentation and uh, new insights. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, first, with regard to microsporidia as a uh, agent which infects cross species, yeah. right? It it yes. infects uh, um, uh, you know range of organisms. Uh, have you seen any uh, uh, any organism with regard to sporidia, microsporidia, which infects two or more than uh, two species at a time and completes their life cycle? So the problem of culturing of this organism can be solved. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, for example, yeah, I mean it's an interesting question, and you know there are organisms which can infect more than one species at a time. And mm -hmm. the scary part is, you know, some of these organisms are also zoonotic. You know, they can okay. jump from, they can jump from an animal host <laughs> to humans in some cases. So we have to be really okay. very careful. And because this field is still developing, we don't, we cannot mm -hmm. be, uh, I would say, experimental, very, you know, freely experimental in changing the hosts. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there have been studies where, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, microsporidia that are present in mosquito uh, have also been seen to affect human immunocompromised human patients. So okay. you know that becomes okay. a scary scenario. Uh, 
but uh, but essentially you know it's a great idea that you know if you could use more than one species and this is something that we do in the lab for example the microsporidia that is the uh, the viremorph and necatrix is essentially used uh, to culture in something that's called a corn earworm uh, mm -hmm. that's what we essentially use but now we have been trying to develop an alternate system of uh, rearing these such that you know if you don't have one organism to uh, rear it you could always use the second one but yes that is something that could yeah. be done Yes. Second is with regard to loss of genes in this organism, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you also talked about uh, uh, hibernation, uh, LSO2 factor. Hmm. Uh, is this common phenomena that if a cell or and this organism which experiences stress and loss of nutrition, that means nutritional yeah. stress and and then sequestering of ribosome is a common phenomenon in all the organisms which experiences nutritional stress? Uh, I would say it is a general phenomenon and it is observed in bacteria. Uh, you know, it's, it's very prevalent in bacteria, most of the bacteria that we know. And mm -hmm. if you look at this evolutionarily, right, you know, because ribosome, uh, protein synthesis itself consumes like probably 50 to 70 percent of energy consumption of the cells. Uh, so, you mm -hmm. know, this energy goes into making ribosomes and then the ribosomes working to make other proteins. So, right. uh, if we were to design an efficient system of the cell, it would make sense not to degrade ribosomes every time you were to stop translation. You know, maybe there was nutrition deprivation and then, you know, the cell would think that, okay, let's not degrade these ribosomes. Let's mm -hmm. put them aside uh, mm -hmm. in an inactive state. And whenever there is a nutritional upshift, you would just, you know, mm -hmm. take out this factor that blocks the ribosome and then, you know, put them back mm -hmm. into the translation cycle. So, yes, I would say that yeah. hibernation is uh, a common phenomenon, but there is uh, a very good variability or uh, a diversification in which uh, factors that are used for hibernation. And I think LSO2 is interesting, but we essentially are also, you know, uh, because we cannot do a lot of... Uh, uh, in vitro or in vivo studies with these organisms, we think that LSO2 is a hibernation factor for sure. Mm -hmm. But at what stage does it act? Does it have another partners in hibernation? We don't know about that. Yeah. Here brings another like, interesting, like curiosity driven question. Yeah. If LSO2 is an inhibitor, right? It, it's a hibernation factor. When yes, cell experiences... So. Uh, when cell experiences favorable condition, like, you know, nutritional status restoring, do you think this LSO factor is being yeah. degraded by some uh, ubiquitination uh, proteasome pathway or is, is uh, this kind of so. reports are there? Okay. So, Great. for example, and the study that I talked about in yeast, LSO2 in yeast. Mm -hmm. So, there, mm -hmm. uh, LSO2 is required for, uh, for example, you know, uh, reversal of translation. You know, so, for example, when the cells have to be brought back uh, into translation or the ribosomes have to be brought back into translation, so LSO2 does play a role there as well. So it is required. But I'm not really sure of what is actually, you know, physiology regulation behind LSO2 in microsporidia. I'm not sure about it. Is Thank you. Or not. Yeah. Thank you so much. Such a wonderful I know presentation and nice to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah, same here. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. So there is one more question. Have you used any computational resources or tools for your work? Uh, yes. Uh, so one of these initial, so you know, everything that comes after, you know, for example, getting our sample uh, is essentially computational. So the so for, right from, you know, for example, if I were to go back to my slides and then uh, maybe talk to you about this um, little scheme that I talked about here. So anything that, you know, starts, so this is a significant, it's not computation, but it is more of, you know, you know using, using automation, but everything apart from, from here, Till here is essentially computational, and this is sort of the minimum 
sort of pipeline that I am showing you. Now there is a lot of uh, stuff that goes into you know averaging or extracting these 2D images and averaging them back and classifying them into 2D and 3D images and then you know uh, doing molecular refinements and corrections to derive something that's like a 3D map and then you know you would build one molecule chain at a time to derive the 3D model. So everything in this domain is essentially computational. Uh, we don't develop any of this uh, to be clear, but we just use the resources or the computational algorithms and programs that are developed by uh, a lot of other, you know, uh, a lot of others in the field. Uh, and some of them just do this, you know, they are only involved in maybe improving the microscope data acquisition or just improving any of these stages from here or here. Uh, so, you know, yeah, that's, there, there are some techniques, uh, computational method that we used uh, for 2D analysis, as well as uh, the tomography part that I briefly described, you know, at this stage from here till here and the uh, subsequent processing. Uh, there are a range of softwares, uh, but I think uh, the use of this would be dependent on what you want to do. Okay, any more questions? Any more queries you want to ask? I think, okay. Okay. So uh, we are not uh, have any. Okay, have you identified any hibernation promoting factor and ribosome modulating factor? So NFL2, I think, is a hibernation promoting factor. Uh, we hope so. Uh, and I think because it is sort of uh, incompatible with the active translation sites on the ribosome, so we strongly think that this is a hibernation factor. And I think. Uh, our uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, yeast or uh, human ribosomes. So I think LSO2 is a hibernation factor, but we have not found out any modulation factor. Okay. Anyone else? So uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Himanshu, for taking your time and deliver this session. It was really informative and definitely it added up to our knowledge. And I uh, thank you once again for accepting the invitation. It was really uh, great to have you here and uh, to have you in this Atul FDP. So, and I would also request you to please share this uh, PowerPoint with us. Uh, I will be sharing the same with the uh, participants. Uh, thank you once again. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. So participants, uh, thank you all for joining the session and we will have our validatory session and the exam that will be around at 2.30 p.m. You can just fill your attendance right now and we'll be joining back at 2.30 for your validatory and exam session. Okay, thank you all. I'll be ending the session. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dr. Manchu. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you.